Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this very special podcast event. For those that don't know me, I'm Andy Hoffman, Marketing Director of Miles Franklin Precious Metals in our 27th year in business. Well, it's been 15 months since the Miles Franklin All-Star Silver Panel webinar, which you can find at milesfranklin.com or via Google, on which David Morgan, Steve St. Angelo, Harvey Organ, Bill Holter, and myself discuss the outlook for silver supply, demand, mining, and trading, which for the most part was extremely prescient in its conclusions. By trade, none of us are financial advisors, and thus we did not discuss the perennial $64,000 question of when the silver bull market would recommence, or more aptly put, when the cartel would be defeated. However, our expectations for supply and demand were spot on, and given the damage the cartel has done to the primary silver mining industry, and economic mother nature on secondary silver mining from base metal projects, it's highly likely that a perfect storm of exploding demand and declining production is heading our way in the very near term. Frankly, my advice to those listening to this on the internet is the following. Hit pause, go back and listen to the All-Star Silver Panel webinar, which you can find by simply Googling the title, and then come back and listen to today's update. As for today's podcast, Given the increasingly tumultuous state of the global economy, financial markets, and geopolitical landscape, in an environment where global silver demand achieved yet another record high in 2015, in the process catalyzing the most acute product shortage the bullion industry has witnessed since 2008, we thought it was a perfect time to ask the experts what they think will transpire in the silver market and by proxy the gold market in the coming years, as well as, for what it's worth, any thoughts they might have about the very near term. Moreover, having just read David Morgan and Chris Marchese's must-read book, The Silver Manifesto, I wanted to use this forum to highlight its value for those seeking to understand not only the drivers of silver investment, but silver's history, mining, and, of course, manipulation. On this call, I will pose myriad diverse questions to our panel of experts regarding all facets of the silver market, including supply, demand, inventories, primary and secondary mining, trading, and the retail bullion industry. You are welcome to type in questions, but in the interest of holding this webinar to roughly an hour's time, I do not anticipate having much time to answer them in this forum. However, any questions we cannot get to here, we promise to personally answer after the webinar is completed. That said, let's start by introducing our expert panel, starting with David Morgan, who, well before I joined the precious metal community in 2002, was one of the world's preeminent silver experts. David operates the silver-investor.com website, and has published the Morgan Report for more than 15 years. In my view, one of the best subscription-based websites in the precious metals arena. Next, we have Chris Marchese, the Morgan Report's Chief Equity and Economic Analyst, co-author of the Silver Manifesto, and co-founder of the America's Great Awakening website. Chris's resume of hardcore Wall Street plus precious metals mining and analysis is eerily similar to my own. Thus, I eagerly anticipate hearing his views on today's topics. And last, but far from least, is Miles Franklin's president and co-founder, Andy Sheckman, who was buying, selling, trading, and storing precious metals before the bull market commenced at the turn of the century. Having worked with him for more than four years, I can objectively say he is one of the most honorable business people I have known and a certified expert in all facets of the retail bullion business. As for me, as Miles Franklin's marketing director, I write and or podcast, along with Miles Franklin's other co-founder, David Sheckman, for the Miles Franklin blog. Our work can be found each day in real time at milesfranklin.com, and I can be reached personally at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. Okay, now that the introductions are out of the way, let's move right to our first question. I will send it David and Chris's way, as it's in their primary area of expertise, and Andy and I will chime in if we have anything to add. That question relates to global silver demand, as we try to validate exactly what it was in 2015 relative to 2014. 2011, when we surged to $50 an ounce, and 2008, amidst the worst financial crisis of our lifetimes. That is, from the time of the financial crisis until today. Trying to get exact figures are difficult, given how few official sources are available, not to mention silver's dual demand nature, as it is not only a monetary metal, but a highly sought-after industrial metal. However, if anyone can do it, it's David and Chris. Gentlemen? I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, and Chris May, uh, Andy. First of all, welcome, everybody, and thank you for giving us your time for this hopefully most interesting discussion on the silver market. The overall trend has been pretty flat 
for uh, industrial demand. Industrial demand from about 2000 to about 2006, 7 was significantly increasing, where you had the amount of silver demand about 35% of the total market in 2000. By 2006 or 7, it was 50% of the total market, but it has remained at about 50% of the total market, and again, flat for probably the last 8 to 10 years or so. Uh, it ebbs and flows up and down a couple percent, up and down, depending on overall global economic conditions. As far as uh, demand coming from monetary demand, we saw a huge surge in monetary demand once the initial silver funds were started, primarily the SLV ETF, which gobbled up purportedly nothing but physical, although that can be brought into question later if you like. But a great deal of physical was bought in the early 2000s through about the 2008, 9, 10 level uh, of time, <clears throat> excuse me, time. And after the uh, takedown from the 2011 high, there's been basically no investment demand from the, in, uh, from the uh, side of the professionals. In other words, the Central Funds of Canada, uh, Sprott Silver Trust, uh, all of the professionals or institutional investors have basically not participated in physical silver from that time till now. So basically I'm saying the last five years. However, the retail demand has gone through the roof. And if you look at the retail demand, which I classify as being primarily government minted coins like Silver Eagles, etc., you can make a pretty strong case that those are being bought not so much by the small investor or what I consider retail investor, but that retail product is being bought in a great or a great degree by institutions. So that's a, kind of a broad brush. If you want to get more numbers, you probably should uh, put Chris on the mic and he could probably give you more numbers if that's what you're interested in. Oh, absolutely. And, and before we get to Chris's view, I just want to say to everyone, I think anyone watching those funds, the CEF, the Sprott Fund, is, is quite aware that they will do deals anytime there's a reasonable premium to net asset value. It's been my view for the past three or four years that the cartel has purposely been making sure that they don't trade at premiums to net asset value so that uh, Eric Sprott and Stefan Spicer don't do that. How that will play out in the future, I don't know, but it's it's a uh, it's always something that's under the market. That if they lose control of that premium, you're going to see uh, major increases in uh, in purchases by them. And of course, it was those purchases that helped push the price of silver up to fifty dollars an ounce back in 2011. Now, Chris, what is your view on demand uh, from the uh, from the mathematical side? Okay, well, you know, it like David said, it increased from 2000 basically to 2008. And it's remained more or less flat, uh, ticking up a little bit, ticking down a little bit. And, you know, that's really because the world economy hasn't been growing, despite, you know, uh, these government figures saying otherwise. And, you know, when the world economy is stagnating, you know, it's hard to have a growing industrial component. So, you know, I think that's the primary reason why. And, you know, very few people realize this. They just say, uh, the industrial aspect has, you know, stagnated for silver without really qualifying why that is. So then well, we what have, percent? Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, has the industrial demand actually declined since 2008, or is it roughly the same? Um, it's increased a little bit, but as a percentage of total mine supply, or primary mine supply, let's say, um, you know, it's been flat to maybe even falling a little bit because mine supply has been growing quite robustly until, you know, I think this year we'll see it uh, fall a little bit. And right. then we have, okay, that, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the paper traded products like the PSLVs, the CEFs, um, the SLV, if you want to call it that. And, you know, you're exactly right. There is not a big enough premium to NAV for them to go out and want to buy uh, more metals, silver, gold, platinum, palladium, 
or what have you. you know, that's part of the reason why Sprott tried to go after the central front of Canada because the, um, the fees that investors pay were higher, so they would make more money and can buy more metal that way. Right, they'd uh, like to make it a, a more attractive product, which might push the net asset value higher. But that's another story. But the fact is you're saying retail demand has more than made up for uh, the, fl the stagnant uh, industrial demand. But, of course, because the price has been falling, it is uh, certainly here in, in the Western Hemisphere, it's, it hasn't driven the impetus to take out the, you know, the, the slim inventory that are there, which is another story, which we'll get to in a second. Is that correct? Yeah. And, uh, you know, in the Eastern world, uh, India, I think through the first eight months of 2015, they were on pace to have net silver imports that were equivalent to 80 or 35 percent of primary silver production, which is very significant, especially if you look at how much they've done over recent years. They've continued to set record after record after record, and this is going to be another one of those years. Then you have China, which... Yeah, most of the silver is delivered on small domestic exchanges, like the white uh, silver, the white uh, platinum and silver exchanges, which don't report figures. So we have no idea what what the real demand is like out there. Right. It's fair to say that it's it's strong as well, since their gold demand is at a record high. And again, you know, you're talking about Indian demand being almost as much as production. Uh, we know that Chinese demand was almost as much as production. So again, it calls to, to, to question where the inventories are coming from, and that's going to be later on in this phone call. But the fact is, this has been a, a consistent theme for a long time now of demand being greater than supply, no matter what is published. Uh, just by looking at numbers such as from China and India, it's pretty clear that the uh, that inventories are being drawn from somewhere. And, uh, you know, we're, I think it's pretty clear there's not that much inventory out there. So that's, you know, that's that's an accident waiting to happen. So. Let's move on next to the, the, supply, the supply side of the equation. Uh, new mining production is obviously the largest source of supply, but scrap and other factors play into the equation as well. Moreover, a point emphasized strongly on the All-Star Silver Panel webinar, as well as several hundred articles, is that unlike gold, which is principally mined by primary gold miners, between 50 and 70 percent of silver production is the byproduct of copper, lead, and zinc mines. On the Silver Panel webinar in October 2014, we cumulatively opined that the collapse in global economy we all anticipated, which has decidedly come to fruition, could catalyze imploding base metal prices, which also has decidedly occurred, and subsequently mine closures, capex reductions, M&A, and numerous other factors that cumulatively could yield dramatic silver production declines. In recent weeks, Steve St. Angelo's analysis of available data through the third quarter suggests global production may have declined by more than 5% in 2015, so I'd love to hear what David and Chris have to say on this matter. As far as I know, the consensus was that silver production would not decline this much, if at all. However, only in David and Chris can tell us from their detailed analysis of the world's primary and, sil uh, and secondary silver mines exactly what they expected and what they see now. To that end, in recent weeks, Nearly all reporting primary silver miners have forecast flat to declining production for 2016, whilst production of the world's largest silver mining nation, Mexico, was reported to have actually declined in 2015, while in the U.S., production plunged by a whopping 19% in both September and October. In other words, highly ominous trends, to say the least. Gentlemen, when all is said and done, where do you think 2015 silver production ended up relative to 2014? And given the current state of the mining industry, as well as gold, silver, copper, lead, and zinc prices, what is your base case scenario for 2016 and beyond? A question, I might add, that all recognize to be subject to numerous, as yet unknowable and unpredictable factors. David, Chris? Yeah, I'll take this one to start, and Chris can fill in uh, the broad brush again. Uh, definitely probably the most important question for anybody that really wants to understand the silver market. So I'm going to take you back in time, and I'm going to bring you to what you asked in 2015 and 16. I'm going to compare 2006, or, excuse me, 2015 to 2014. First of all, there's been the word shortage used in the silver market probably too often, and I don't want to play word games or semantics, but here's the deal. If you go from 1999 to and through inclusive 2006, or 2005, depending whether you use the Silver Institute study or CPM study. We were in a deficit. 
Now, you can call a deficit a shortage if you want. I don't care. I'm going to use the word deficit to distinguish it from the word shortage. And a deficit meant that the total demand was greater than what the supply was, but the, the amount of silver that was lacking was made up from above ground supplies. So in 1999, the above ground silver supply was roughly 2 billion ounces in silver form, which means 1,000 ounce bars for all practical purposes, commercial bars. I'm not talking about tea sets, I'm not talking about jewelry, and I'm not talking about silverware. I'm talking about the silver market. Silver market is determined by commercial bars. That's what sets the price. So from 1999 to 2006, for roughly 16 years approximately, we were eating up supply at 100 million ounces a year. And at that time, we were probably at the lowest silver supply in modern times, at about 500 million ounces. From that time till now, so meaning the last 10 years, we have been on a build of inventory from that 500 million ounces back up to about 2 billion ounces. Now, it's a different 2 billion, and I'll explain that. 1 billion ounces is in commercial bars, and the other billion is in silver rounds or basically government-minted coins like silver eagles, silver maples, um, the Austrian Philharmonic. Uh, the Lunar Series from Australia and other government mints and silver rounds. And uh, we could even throw in the small 10-ounce bars and 100-ounce bars. So there's actually been a build in inventory. Now, before anyone starts getting upset that everything is dictated by supply and demand, which it should be and truly at some time is, if they think, oh, my goodness, David just told us there's 2 billion ounces above ground in investable form, and that's when the Hunt brothers, you know, were in the market. So think about this. The Hunt brothers and all the other silver investors, and believe me, the Hunt brothers were well in before the $50 peak. If, they, if the market went from roughly $1.29 to $50 in a 15-year time frame, and there were 2 billion ounces above ground, and it was only a U.S. market primarily, think of a 2 billion ounce market when it's a world global market, we have the internet and supplies are tightly held and dispersed better than they were during the hunt days. So I'm not worried about the increase in supply. What I'm worried about is being able to get supply at some point. Now specifically to your question, and by the way, just to further the point, uh, we've done this many times. I do it almost every lecture I give. I show a chart of what the increased production has been on silver. And the other part of the equation is price. Uh, right now, a lot of mines are not starting. Some are, you know, closing up or curtailing production. And this is because the price is so low they can't make a profit. But it's, a, it's an economic question. If you get silver back up to 50 or 70 or something like that, a lot of uneconomic mines will come into production. And we went through great lengths to talk about peak silver in the book, expressing that function not as a math formula but as a statement of fact. And we, Chris and I, don't think we would see peak silver probably for a few more years, if and only if we see an increase in price, which, of course, we expect. So 14 to 15, roughly the same, nothing significant. 2016 will probably be flat slightly lower. Uh, I'm just going to say it in general terms. Chris, if you want to get specifics, uh, please do so. And Chris, if, before you answer, I want, if you have the prices of today's copper, lead, and zinc, and gold and silver, does that change what your base case has been all along? For uh, peak silver? For silver today versus, uh, you know, your, your expectation for 2016 as it's always been versus has it changed because of the prices uh, oh, that have moved down yeah, so rapidly? It's definitely changed, uh, especially if you look at um, the copper price, not that copper accounts for, I don't know, about 25% of silver production from primary copper mines. And, uh, you know, these prices around $2, $2.10 cents a pound, um, that's not high enough for a lot of primary copper mines to survive for prolonged periods of time. When it comes to primary lead zinc mines, you have two things uh, to think about. There's a lot of primary zinc mines coming offline anyway just because they are reaching 
uh, becoming fully depleted. And with the low prices, you know, that will have cause others to become uneconomic or not economic enough, uh, at least in this environment. So it would be uh, put on care and maintenance or something to that effect. So, you know, we saw a big increase in primary supply in 2014, uh, quite a bit above our estimates. And, you know, I think, um, you know, it'll fall about 1 to 2 percent this year. That, that is in 2015. We haven't seen the numbers yet, obviously. In 2016, you know, it's really all a function of what copper, lead, and zinc prices do, as well as... But at today's, at uh, today's prices, but today, at today's prices, what do you think 2016 and beyond will look like? Oh, uh, I don't think that, you know, supply is going to have... Uh, it's going to have a hard time increasing more than 1%, if not decreasing. You know, it's so hard to tell because a lot of the silver comes from some of the world-class copper mines, which are still making money at, even at these prices, and some of the, you know, high-quality lead zinc mines, which are still making a little bit of money. But see, if we have silver prices increase uh, 25 30 40%, a lot of these mines will then become economic. And then you've got the silver in primary gold mines. Uh, if gold prices increase, there'll be a lot more silver production from there. It only accounts for about 12 to 14 percent of primary uh, of silver production. But you know, you add all these things up, and you know, it's really so sensitive in terms of the price of the primary commodity to come up with um, good estimates. Really. Well, is the, is there any scenario? that silver production could actually materially increase. And, you know, given, given what we expect for demand, it really doesn't matter if silver production is flat, up 5%, 2%. Is there really any scenario in the next, in the coming years that could possibly make uh, supply significantly increase in the coming years? Only if the price of silver increases. That's really, that's really it. Um, or the price of uh, a lot of these base metals, like, copper, for instance, but I don't see how that would happen, given, you know, a lot of the these um, mega mines are still being developed because they can make money down here. Right. So I, I guess it sounds to me, unless you have a dramatic change in prices, that the, the outlook is probably best, you know, base case scenario is going to be relatively flat in most scenarios. More, more or less, yes. Okay. Because that's, that's all we need to establish here. I mean, yes, it's possible that, that prices collapse further. And, uh, you know, copper is fifty, and zinc and lead are 50 cents, which, frankly, I believe is a big possibility for what it's worth. But the fact is, given what we all expect for demand and inventories, which we're going to talk about next, the fact that there's really not much impetus out there for supply to do anything except hang around here at best uh, is, is really all I'm getting to. So... Uh, on that, let's next go to David and Chris's take on just how much inventory exists above ground. And more importantly, how much is likely available for sale, let alone at today's historically suppressed prices. This is not a new topic for David's readers and listeners, and I'm guessing the simple answer continues to be no more than 2 billion ounces or so, which at today's cartel suppressed price of 1450 an ounce is valued at a mere $29 billion dollars or less than half of what the ECB prints each month. Which, putting it into perspective, oh, is about the amount the ECB prints every 12 days, <laughs> is what I wrote. And now, according to Mario Draghi, they're going to be increasing the amount that they print starting next March. David and Chris, this is actually a three-part question. First, where do you stand on said 2 billion ounce estimate for above-ground physical silver inventories? Second, how much do you think is actually available for sale? And finally, do you believe worldwide inventories have materially changed in the 15 months since our all-star webinar panel? Oh, great question. I'll take it again. I'll let Chris do more of the details. But yeah, I will stand by the 2 billion ounce number. I will state that uh, all uh, the industrial demand, excuse me, the uh, professional investment demand is roughly one billion. Almost all that is held as commercial bars for investment purposes. And it's been flat, as I said, for almost five years. In fact, I gave that chart 
uh, during my lecture in uh, Vancouver on Monday, a couple days ago, and uh, had a not a flood of people, but a couple that were questioning that was it really true that you know the Stefan Spicers, the Eric Sprotts, the Zurich Continental Bank, uh, these large money managed funds, uh, the Swiss, whatever have not actually bought any physical commercial bars for investment purposes for the last five years? And the answer is yes, they have not. However, as I said earlier, the retail product has been bought significantly, and it remains to be determined whether or not that's uh, you know retail investors or partially um, professionals. And I could argue strongly as professionals, and Andy and Andy could probably give us their data on that, but my input, and I talked to a lot of the mainstream dealers uh, that are of size, substantial, you know, they sell, you know, millions of dollars on an annual basis of, you know, these type of products, and the retail demand from what I've heard from various sources is not that significant, yet you see record sales being taken place throughout the uh, government mintages. So anyway, back on point, now we haven't seen uh, much of a change in that, and I forget the other part of the question, uh, Andy, if you could just refresh my memory, sorry. Well, well it's, it's how much is available for sale. Third quarter of 2015 was almost as bad when it comes to silver. The U.S. Mint and the Canadian Mint both were offline. When they finally did come back online, premiums, my cost on Eagles and Maple Leafs were north of $4 an ounce over the melt value. That's an increase of about 300% in premium, well, 200 for sure. Uh, and so I guess the point is, is this. This industry has a very peculiar habit of as the price falls, the demand picks up exponentially and the product all but completely and totally disappears. And which leads me to my comment about David's comment being very thought-provoking. You have to understand something, that the U.S. Mint and the Canadian Mint cannot keep up with demand and are both making north of, I don't know, 50 million silver coins each, 40, 50 million silver coins each per year. And this is happening as the price is getting clobbered and uh, year over year. And it, it begs, I guess, to, to ponder, are the rules and the laws of supply and demand being rewritten? as it pertains to this industry, or is something more nefarious happening? It, are the professionals gobbling up all of the maples and the eagles, or are the professionals calling their buddies and saying, hey, listen, you know, J.P. Morgan is amassing a couple hundred million ounces of silver as the price is falling. Are they calling their buddies and saying, load up as many silver eagles as you can, buy as many silver maples as you can? Could it be something bigger and more nefarious? Because David is right. We did do... Uh, you know, 300 million in sales last year. We're, we're not one of the biggest companies in the world, but the point of it is, is that somebody is buying an awful lot more silver eagles and silver maple leaves than the handful of big companies in this country are selling. And so, um, I can tell you that without question, since that time in Las Vegas with David, and since that happened in 2008, it has been my contention 100% that eventually. The lack of physical supply and good product will, will define this marketplace before it's over. And I don't know when that will happen, but when we do see those dislocations where product is impossible to get, I don't care how much money you have, nobody sells it, and it's impossible to get it, and it doesn't matter if I have a seven-figure order, I can't place it. So, um, you know, it, 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 it certainly has been a, a central focus uh, of, of me and a concern, and uh, after the third quarter, uh, when we got towards the end of the year and supplies somewhat normalized, we spent as much money as we could loading up on supply, specifically uh, because I just think that uh, there will come a time uh, when getting supply will be all but impossible of good things. So, you know, it's, it's certainly very, very important and central focus here at Miles Frankel. Well, you know, when I go back to when I first started reading GATA back in 2002, which has been my inspiration for my career or my second career, you know, it's not rocket science here. It, it was, you know, what Bill Murphy was saying way back when. It all comes down to when 
the exploding physical demand swamps the supply that's out there. A lot of that supply we don't see. A lot of it is hypothecated. It's, it's leased. But the fact is all everything that we've heard on this call and everything we've seen around us is showing that that supply is just not there. Uh, David and Chris just verified again that the you know the the supply is not has not increased materially and it's not going to anytime soon. The amount of uh, in, of industrial demand has been relatively flat, leaving again this little sliver uh, of actual production available for investment use, and it's a tiny tiny amount. So uh, just like the the overall gold and silver markets are going to be subject over time simply to the force of supply and demand. The same thing goes in, as you know, what David mentioned earlier, the very small, relatively trivial retail business, which has a very, very short supply. And again, the fact that Miles Franklin and all the world's dealers had shortages in 2008, 2011, 2013, and 2015, uh, in the latter few times during times of non-crisis, when prices weren't even rising, shows you how thin the market is. And I think this webinar certainly validated again that the supply-demand forces we're talking about are only going to be getting tighter in the coming years. Well, that about wraps up today's 2016 Silver Outlook webinar. Personally, I believe 2016 on multiple levels will not only be unlike anything any of us have witnessed, but potentially a major inflection point in history. How that will relate to the cartel's ability to prevent silver amidst an environment of exploding demand, vanishing inventories, and plunging supply from realizing its ultimate potential, I don't know. However, I do know that when that day inevitably arrives, you'll be kicking yourself for not having protected at least a portion of your life savings with the only assets proven to preserve purchasing power throughout history, let alone at such comically depressed prices. To that end, it's quite rare to find insurance at its cheapest when it's needed the most which is exactly how I characterize the physical silver and gold markets today. Thanks again to David Morgan, Chris Marchese, and Andy Schechtman, and hopefully everyone listening has learned something new and incremental. Again, we highly recommend the services offered at silver-investor.com, as well as the fabulous Silver Manifesto book available at Amazon.com for just $9.99 on Kindle readers. As for Miles Franklin, if you are considering the purchase, sale, or storage of precious metals, we cannot emphasize enough our industry-leading track record of an A-plus Better Business Bureau rating, not a single registered complaint in 27 years of business, and an unparalleled free daily educational platform, the Miles Franklin blog. For more information, please go to milesfranklin.com or email me at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. Thank you very much to our panelists and our listeners.